Well, Laura would say there's no fear in that. So, all right. Here we go. Um, you know, Israel uh, continues to be in the, in the news. The Middle East is uh, at war. Um, there are uh, anti-Semitic uh, protests uh, all over the place. Um, I was warned of one in New York City that might get explosive, I think, today. And so and this thing continues on and people continue to have questions about what, what's, what's going on. And I would love to say, you know, that whoopee, um, this is it, folks. Uh, but uh, who knows? We don't know. Last year, last year, last week, we talked about wars and rumors of, of war. And I'd like to continue that, that train of thought a little bit here, that the real battle is a spiritual battle. Israel went through a number of elections starting in 2018. Uh, the ultra-conservative uh, and the liberal ring, uh, liberal wing of government, had really, really tight margins. Uh, it was like 61, 62 people in a in a 120-seat Knesset in the government. So it was really difficult to form a coalition government, and they kept having elections over and over and over again, trying to unify the government. And the ultra-Orthodox was trying to control, and was still trying to control, who could be a citizen of Israel, who is Jewish, who can pray at the Western Wall. And I'm not knocking the ultra-Orthodox at all. Uh, what I'm pointing out, though, is that they're, they're, they've been a fractured people group uh, who, who can't afford to be fractured. When you're operating with so few people to begin with on a global scale and living in, a, in the Middle East where you're surrounded by people who don't like you, you really can't afford to be fractured because there's always a threat to Israel's existence. So what happened to Israel uh, is what happened 2,000 years ago. And we can look back to that. Some rabbis in Israel today recognize that the growing baseless hate between Jews blinded them from the external threats, namely Satan, but rearing its head in uh, Hamas. Secular Jews and Orthodox Jews have been at each other for years. Part of the argument has been a question of who is a Jew? Anyone who converted from Judaism or was deemed Jewish by Reformed Jews would have that designation nullified by the ultra-Orthodox Jews. And this affected Russians, Russian Jews who came in that couldn't fully document their background. And then all of a sudden the ultra-Orthodox is saying, well, you're no, no longer a Jew. And since many Russian Jews had come to Israel since the Berlin Wall fell, Many had known that they were Jewish, unable to connect all of the genealogical dots. And a rabbi had declared them to be Jewish. And then, and then the ultra-Orthodox would say no. And there's this clash that goes on between the Reform and the ultra-Orthodox. It's a splintered people group. Orthodox have sought to stay out of the IDF because their kids are more likely to be in yeshivas during... Uh, of being educated than, than others. And it became an us and them situation, infighting, taking their eyes off of God while they fought amongst each other. Even Messianic Jews, Jews in Israel who came to faith, were being marginalized. Even in a threat of taking away the right of the uh, return for Jews like me, whose grandparents did not return to Israel in 1948. Right now, I have a, a right of return. I could go on the basis of uh, my grandmother. Um, but the ultra-Orthodox Jews want to take that right away. So I'm thinking of, I, I'd really love to exercise that quickly. But who knows the Lord's timing. The point is, though, it's infighting, created by baseless hate. But the latest war with Hamas has worked to reunite some of those factions. Um, what, the, what Satan had used as something evil has worked to something good. Because an attack on one Jew is considered an attack on all. Jewish people are the apple of God's eye. 
God's people set apart for him. And because of that, Satan would like to obliterate all Jewish people. But we have to be careful because the next group that he's coming after are Christians or believers uh, because they are grafted in to Israel. So for us to sit back and go, well, this is far beyond us. It only relates to Israel is really, really a bad place to be in. We're grafted in. There's also baseless hate, although it's more of a baseless dislike between denominations within Christianity that just opens up that door for Satan to get in because there's infighting that's taking on or going on. And Satan is waiting in the wings to take over a house divided. Satan uses our egos and ignorance to divide believers, just as he did with the Jewish people and has over the decades and, and centuries. And when a house is divided, it falls, and Satan worms his way in to destroy the weak and the vulnerable. How was Satan able to attack Israel so viciously and with so much surprise? Because Israel was in a stupor. It was asleep at the wheel, made sleepy because of inward loathing. And we have to be careful of that. The Christian church is divided and headed in a death spiral because some believe God's word is inerrant and unchangeable and others disagree, saying that God's word is fluid and some forms of lawlessness or sin are okay because times have changed. And God help us wade through all of that load of garbage because God's word is unchangeable. We may not like it, but that's tough because we are the created. The character of mankind hasn't changed much over the centuries. There was homosexuality, rape, murder, lying, and stealing 2,000 years ago and 3,500 years ago. The evil and wickedness today is, much as it, is as much as it was then. Times haven't changed. We have been duped by Satan into thinking that they have. In the meantime, the house divides and Satan wanders in seeking whom he will devour. We wander away from God's word and quarrel among each other and wonder why Satan gets in. We're supposed to be guarding our hearts with God's word and guarding each other spiritually. And when we don't, Satan enters the camp and destroys because we are preoccupied with other stuff. Messianic Rabbi Itzhak Shapira points out that the spiritual forces at work today started in a battle long ago with a fellow by the name of Amalek who resisted Israel, if you remember that story. So long as the sons of Esau survived, the spiritual battle is going to go on and on. And as we know from the Apostle Paul, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but it is a spiritual battle that wages above us and is manifest among us. The battle will finish when the Messiah's son of David defeats Amalek, and Satan. There are people who say that the work of Yeshua was finished at the cross, which is true in some ways, yet that doesn't mean that there will never be any terrifying day of the Lord when the Messiah, son of David, rides into the final battle and throws Satan into the lake of fire to destroy him forever. Psalm 9-7 says, the enemy is finished and ruins forever. You overturned their cities, even the memory of them has perished. There, there is a day coming that's going to be a, a terrible day. Satan is the true enemy of the Jewish people. It, it, it's happening right now in, in front of us. Where it looks like Israel and Hamas and other Arab countries are fighting. But Israel as a people is engaged in a spiritual battle where Satan is seeking to destroy Israel and the plan of redemption. And, and you look at what's going on there and you see humans interacting in battle. And yet it's, it's the IDF, really, it's the IDF against the spiritual forces of evil. It's an amazing thing to watch. It's almost like you're living in a sci-fi movie. Perhaps shockingly, Amos 1 is a prophecy of the future events. And now, most prophecy is cyclical. 
Uh, it ha sometimes it happens over and over again. Uh, most prophecy has a current relevancy when it was written, but also a manifestation in the future. Here's Amos 1, verse 6. Thus says Adonai, For three crimes of Gaza, even four, I will not relent. For they exiled an entire population, giving them over to Edom. So I will send fire on the wall of Gaza. It will devour their citadels. I will cut off Ashdod's inhabitants, wielding Ashkelon's scepter. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the rest of the Philistines will perish. Notice the similarities, even to the point of who is captured. Everyone, the young, the old, the infirm. Amos 1 continues with a judgment on Lebanon. It is a battle that has waged since Exodus 17, 8, where it says, Then the Am uh, Am uh, Amalekites came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. What has happened in the past and is projected to happen in the future is happening right now on, on, a, on a different level. The battle for Israel requires destruction from within. Division within, and the people become weak and thirsty for the word of God. And that's what's happened in Israel, is they became weak and thirsty for God. How much of uh, Israel is secular? Most of it is secular. And yet they're the Jewish people. And they're weak, they're thirsty, and so Satan comes on in. Moses spoke of Amalek in Deuteronomy chapter 25, starting at verse 17, saying, Remember what Amalek did to you along the way as you came out from Egypt, how he happened upon you along the way and attacked those among you in the rear, all the stragglers behind you. When you were tired and weary, he did not fear God. Hamas didn't fear God on October 7th, doesn't fear God now. And he's and they're after the stragglers. Look how many children and, and women and elderly people were abducted and brought in. And that's like on a small scale compared to what Scripture is talking about. It's amazing to see. And if you're wondering if God is in control, here are elements that we're seeing here where you know that God is controlled because it's in the Bible. The spirit of fatigue is found in Genesis 25, verse 30, where Esau says to Jacob, give me some of that red stuff to eat because I am famished. It's a spirit that rises up so that we can no longer see God's promise to us. It rears its ugly head when Jewish people lose sight of the irrevocable promises and covenants, and it happens among believers who lose sight of the promises and the grafted inness that we have. And we become weary and we become vulnerable. In both cases, the eye is taken off of God and infighting starts. While there is infighting, Satan breaks through and divides. Satan breaks through and weakens the resolve to live within the promises of God. That came up, Jack, and I thought of you. Instead of walking in the light, we walk in the shadows. We become cruel to our brothers and sisters of Messiah. In the case of Israel, baseless hate exploded between the ultra-Orthodox and the secular Jews and everyone in between. Instead of love and commonality, there rose up factions. And we have that among believers today. For us as believers, there are clear biblical hills on which we need to stand our ground because fellow believers have embraced evil lifestyles and abject rejection of God's word. Mm -hmm. There are other things that people will do as they grow in their walk with God, and yet we shouldn't break fellowship with them over it. There are some things that you learn, you go along with it, And this is where the letters to the, of the apostles are helpful. There's a difference between those things that are clear that clearly you should or should not be uh, should not be done. Those things that will grow into that you will grow into through teaching and spiritual maturity, and the spiritual person who's mature knows the difference between the two. 
we take some of our doctrine today right from the the apostle the letters of the apostles and that we have to be very very careful on because those apostolic letters are written about specific problems in specific congregations and if you build all of your doctrine on specific problems you're going to be in specific ways way off base that's why we have to look at the whole bible instead of just one section of it so many of us uh, at least grew up looking at the new testament as a standalone document and it's you know it's it it, it can be, but uh, you have to look at the whole thing and not just the specific problems that they were dealing with. We need to be extremely careful that we do not cause the spirit of baseless hate to develop within the body of Messiah or else we'll give Satan a point of entry and the wolves will be devouring us from the inside out. The wickedness of the Hebrew word Hamas as lawlessness and robbery is, is so apparent today. The Midrash called Genesis Rabbah speaks of Hamas's idolatry, immorality, violent robbery, and a thirst for innocent blood. If you've seen some of the surveillance videos um, taken over the past couple of weeks, you can see that thirst for innocent blood. All of this is something that we've seen in the last three weeks. We've seen how awful uh, this, this hatred is. But as we approach the end days, it's going to become even worse. And here I am lifting you up on a Shabbat morning. But there is good news. There will be horrific sin in inhumanity. Remember that we are created in God's image and inhumane behavior of any sort is opposed to God's character. The task is to reveal God's glory and when people fight, that uh, glory of God is hidden. The battle between uh, the two is going to rage on until Messiah defeats Satan, the battle between Israel and Hamas. The conflict is revealed right in the first few verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was uniform and, and or unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The light that shone was good. What did he say about darkness? He didn't say a thing about darkness. Rashi explains that Elohim was used here because as judge, God's creation was to be under the rule of strict justice. While justice forcibly removed Adam and Eve from the garden, chaos had entered into the world when that happened. And that strict justice is going to return when Messiah Yeshua defeats Satan and God's peace is restored. But in the meantime, our soul is at stake. And I want to make this an encouragement this morning that we need to persevere to the end without sounding Calvinistic. Because mm -hmm. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm maybe a half point Calvinist. Our ability to persevere to the end depends on allowing the Holy Spirit to overcome the flesh. Our fleshly desires align with Amalek and Hamas. And if not held in check by the Holy Spirit, it can destroy us. And you think, I'm not like Amalek. I'm not like Hamas. But who doesn't want revenge for those times that we feel we have been deeply offended? Who has not experienced hate? which we now understand from Yeshua's teaching that hate is the same as murder. Who has not wanted their fair share, even if it means robbing somebody else of money and self-worth or of time? There's a 
movie. I have to bring a movie in here for some reason. I don't know why I feel compelled, but it's not a sci-fi movie. So I can't be picked on for that. The movie is called White Christmas. And there's one scene where Bing uh, Crosby's character, Bob Wallace, and Danny Kaye's character, Phil Davis, have been brought in to watch the Haynes sisters perform at a nightclub, but on false pretenses. That somebody that they had served in uh, World War II with um, wanted them to see uh, his sisters perform. And, Bob, and, and the Haynes sisters, uh, uh, Betty Haynes, wants to apologize. And Bob Wallace says, he says, oh, that's okay. There's a little larceny going on in every one of us. And how true. Although larceny is an understatement. Sometimes there's a lot of hate going on too. But usually there's a little bit of larceny. We want, to, we want our pound of flesh sometimes out of people, even if it's the cashier, even if it's those people that run the gas stations and they're, they're getting a pound of flesh for a gallon of gas, we want to get a pound of flesh back. There's a little Hamas in every one of us, rejection of God's power and supervision as Lord. And that transforms us into our own God, seeking to control our life and the lives around us. We put the Holy Spirit off in a corner somewhere so that we can do our own thing, either in secret or out in the open. And where life matters to God, there's part of us that doesn't care about life, especially eternal life. Where Hamas of the Middle East is out to cut off the limbs and suck the blood out of people, our evil inclination battles against the Holy Spirit. And without feeling, we can walk past somebody that could need the Lord, whose soul is struggling to connect with Yeshua. Their soul is grasping for a connection to eternal life, and we walk right past, not caring. What's the difference? Spiritually, I don't see one. We need to fend off those natural tendencies and give space to the Holy Spirit so that he makes us vessels of the living God. Hebrews 4, which I've quoted a couple of times now in the past couple of weeks, says, Therefore, let us be terrified of the possibility that even uh, though the promise of entering his rest remains, any one of you might be judged to have fallen short of it. For good news has also been proclaimed to us, just as it was to them. But the message they heard didn't do them any good, because those who heard it did not combine it with trust. For it is we who have trusted, who enter rest. We have to put our wholehearted trust in God. The, the Greek word that's used here is pistis. Is that a fun word to say? It's like presho, South Dakota. Pistis. It's used in Hebrews 11 to speak of faith of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, meaning faith or belief or firm persuasion. Or in the complete Jewish study Bible, it, it translates it as trust. We need to trust God. In the Hebrew of Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Because if you don't lean on him, if you don't lean on him and you lean on your own understanding and you don't acknowledge him, you're making yourself into a God, small g. And that doesn't work. We have to trust God that his way will prevail. And this path that he has us on is the perfect path that we need to be on. We can drift far away from God and come up with plans to seem right to us. But according to Proverbs 19, verse 21, where it says, One can devise many plans in one's mind, but Adonai's plan will prevail. And when you're making plans for your life, I'm making some plans right now for my life, for this congregation. But they don't mean anything unless they're God's plans. 
The only plan we should seek is God's plan. All other thoughts need to be tossed out of our head. God's power and lordship have to be paramount. Yes. Matthew 24 says, Now when Yeshua went out and was going away from the temple, his disciples came up to point uh, to him uh, the temple buildings. Don't you see all of these? He responded to them, Amen. I tell you, not one stone will be left here on top of another. Every one will be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And you notice that they asked three questions. When will these things happen? When will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the end of the age? The cause of the destruction of Herod's temple in 70 AD, the rabbis tell us, was because of baseless hate among the Jewish people. Am I one to argue with that? God destroyed it. Why did God destroy it? I, I think they're right. Baseless hate among the different sects of the Jews. There was baseless hate. And because of that baseless hate, I think their eyes were failed from seeing Yeshua as Messiah. People didn't care about people. And they were so involved with arguing amongst themselves, they failed to see that Rome was falling apart and that their society would be imploding. But here we are on the Mount of Olives 30 years earlier. And, there, and here is what Yeshua says. He says, you will not, uh, I'm sorry, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. You will see that you are not, or see to it that you're not alarmed, for this must happen, but it is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, but all of these things are only the beginning of the birth pain. How many wars have there been and famines and earthquakes in the last 2,000 years? A lot. There's getting to be more and more earthquakes. But these are only the beginning of the birth pains. You, you think it's bad now. It's nothing compared to what it's going to be. When I was eight years old, the 1967 Detroit riots happened. And I thought it was horrific. You had the National Guard helicopters flying overhead. You had sirens all over the place. We only lived a couple of miles from the city limits. We had National Guard troops going in. And, and looking it up for this, because that's what came to mind, because I haven't been to war, and that the riots only lasted for five days. To me, they lasted a couple of weeks. But it was only five days. We had National Guard troops. We had fire engines. Fire, uh, and five days seemed like weeks to me. Yet it's nothing like war. There was bloodshed. There was death. There was devastation. But it wasn't like, say, the Vietnam War or any other war, certainly. Today, do you think that trans bathrooms, violations of the First Amendment rights, and being sued for not baking a cake for a same-sex marriage is bad? Just wait. Because Yeshua goes on and he says, then they will hand you over to persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all the nations because of my name. And then many will fall away and will be betray one another and hate one another. I think we're seeing that with the Jewish people and anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. We're seeing it with Christians. Baseless hate will rage on even among believers. And then he says, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. They will teach false doctrines and try to predict when uh, God or predict, predict when the end will come, and only God the Father knows that. 
leading people astray into false hopes and deeper into fear. Instead of trusting God, even believers will trust men. They will fear men more than they will fear God. Verse 12 says, because lawlessness, Hamas, will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. Believers will hate believers so much that they will lose faith, they will become indifferent, and they will rip fellow believers to shreds so much that love will grow cold. What will, be, what will it be like in that day? I think, imagine October 7th on steroids and all over the globe. The enemy, Satan, cares nothing for you, absolutely nothing. The enemy cares nothing about your life, nothing. If you feel besieged during this month as we go into this Halloween uh, period here, don't even look at it. Satan doesn't care about you. He may make you think that he does. He doesn't. When you get drawn into making a decision that is ungodly, he doesn't care about the consequences. We saw Satan unleash Hamas, bloodthirsty violence. It was grotesque and horrific earlier this month. And are you ready for that? There will be hope and reward for every believer who puts their trust in God and holds on to faith and clings to Yeshua HaMashiach. Here's the good news. I've been like really sourpuss today, more so than last week. But this is real stuff, folks. This is real stuff. And I, I'll be out there. I, 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 I've been a pre-tribber for a long time. Started to shift and thinking, well, God will do what God will do. Uh, you know, trying to figure out when things are going to happen, who's going to be left beyond, behind and who's not. Uh, that's all in God's timing and on God's plan. And really, I need to be focused on seeing people built up in the Lord, seeing souls saved, and, and discipling people. But when I read what I'm going to read, I get really worried about left behind, as in the book, as in the movie. And I don't want to be on some sort of bizarre bandwagon this morning. And you can disagree with me, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine, because it's going to turn out the way it's going to turn out, right? And, and somebody's theory on how it's going to turn out is going to be wrong. And that's fine, because God is going to be right. And we may all be surprised in the end. Verse 13 says, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 29 winds up with this uh, almost volley. But immediately after the trouble of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from, the, uh, from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. All will seem lost, but victory is going to be right around the corner. Verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the land will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Can you imagine that? I've got that pictured in my head. I'm just waiting to see it. He will send out his angels with a great shofar. And they will gather together his chosen from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. This is going to be a fantastic day. My prayer, though, is that you'll be so firmly grounded in your faith that you won't be shaken as you go through the tribulations that we're going through. Those things that are happening right now in the Middle East and the threats, you know, that Russia is having nuclear warheads and stuff like that. In the vernacular, we shouldn't give a rip. I was thinking of another word that started with C, but decided my wife was sitting here and I shouldn't use that word. But we, we shouldn't give a hoot about those things because our faith rests in God. And as we've seen, these things are not new. 
These things have happened before and are predicted to happen in the future. And Yeshua is telling us that we need to endure to the end because those of us who hang around, those of us who are believers, are going to be thrown in jail. Those of us uh, that hang around are going to be persecuted. My prayer... My prayer is that you'll stand firm and strong, fight the good fight, and on that day he is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Joshua 1.9, and an admonition and encouragement for us as we see the threat of Hamas increase. The Lord says, have I not commanded you? Hazak, be strong. Do not be terrified or dismayed, for Adonai your God is with you wherever you go. Yeah. Amalek and the forces of evil and Satan don't have power over us. We need to trust God. We need to cling to God. We need to believe God. And we need to live for God. Amen. Baruch Hashem.